Hey guys, how's it going? So it's been a while since I've done an overview of my entire device collection. I think the last time I did that was back in 2017 and I did an overview of my UMPCs, my laptops, and my phones. So uh, I kind of split it up into different videos because I have so many devices. Uh, so today I want to revisit the collection again. So it's been three years and some things in my collection have changed, some things have not. Uh, so you guys can look at and comment uh, about some of these devices again. And I do want to kind of show off my collection a little bit because I do plan to downsize my collection. Um, so I'm going to be selling some of these devices. So yes, I want to do a video before I do that. Um, so yeah, uh, this is going to be my phone collection, which also includes some of my PDAs, my PMPs or media players, and some small tablets as well. So for this collection, I don't have a table big enough to put all my devices on, so I'm just using my bed. So you might be wondering why am I putting all my devices on my bed. I just don't have a table big enough to fit all these. And I organized them according to the year that they were released. So you can see that all the devices are arranged in rows right now. So the bottom row, starting from the bottom row, uh, the bottom row is 2001 to 2005. So this is all the devices released 2001 to 2005. I don't have any devices older than 2000. And the second row is devices released in the year 2006 to 2007. And then the third row are devices released in the year 2008 to 2009. I think I have the most of these devices because there's just so many unique devices released that year or those years. Um, and then the fourth row is 2010 and uh, 2000, up to 2013. So, yeah. And then this is the fifth row and this is 2014 all the way to 2016 devices released in those years and then the top row of course is 2017 all the way to this year 2020 so you can see all the more modern devices released so let's get down to it all right let's go uh, row by row we're gonna start with the bottom here these are the earliest devices that I have so okay this is the earliest device I have this is the Casio Casio Pia B300 which was released in 2001 um, this was the first kind of pocket PC or mobile device that I had. It's kind of a pseudo pocket PC, um, not like a full-fledged pocket PC or anything. It didn't run the latest pocket PC operating systems. Um, it ran uh, Windows CE 3.0, kind of like a modified version of that. But still, this device holds really sentimental value for me since I got this device, I think in 2000, was it 2001, 2002? Anyways, this device just came out and I got it and I was like, <laughs> you know, I'm such a geek, right? I, I was like in the eighth grade and I had a device like this. But yeah, this is like the first PDA, first kind of electronic device that I owned. This and the Cyberco actually. So this one, the Cyberco Extreme, I didn't actually own this model. This came out in 2002. I owned the original model which came out in 2001. So I kind of owned that one first and uh, that one came out a little bit before this one did. This is the successor and uh, I used that one to play games and stuff a lot. So technically that was my first handheld gaming system. You know other people own Game Boys and stuff like that. I owned a Cyberco. So that's how cool I was. <laughs> or uncool I guess. But yeah this is Cyberco Extreme. The successor released in 2002. Um, Casio B300 released 2001. Kind of my first PDA pocket PC kind of device. This is actually technically my first electronic device. I don't know if I should count it because it's like an organizer thing, but I actually owned this way back in like seventh grade or something like that. This is a sharp organizer. Again, not sure if this should really belong here because this isn't a phone or anything like that. It's, it's sort of a PDA, but it's like a pocket organizer thing. I, I used this instead of a calculator when I was in, um, when I was in middle school. So yeah, I guess it's still, still an interesting device. But I put it here anyways just because I have it, right? This, again, these three devices I would consider to be, um, not this one, but the predecessor of this one, the Cyberco. These three would be considered the first electronic devices I ever owned. So they kind of hold sentimental value for me. So yeah, 2001, 2002, I think around 2001, 2002 as well. And then next we have, um, first of all, I have this watch here, this Casio digital watch. I'm not really sure where to put this. This, again, it's kind of like the Sharp. It's not really a... Do I really consider it part of this collection? But it is a digital device, right? So it's not an analog watch. I don't have any of my analog watches here because those are just traditional watches. But since this is, has a calculator in it, this is a calculator watch. So technically, it is sort of a PDA thing. So uh, it doesn't have an operating system. But anyways, I put it here. I didn't know where else to put it. So this is the 
the Casio uh, data bank. Yes, yeah, the Casio data bank calculator watch. I put that here as well. Again, the, Casio has been making these for years and years, so not sure what year that exactly is. All right, getting on to the actual phones now. Um, this is the Motorola V70. It's released 2002. Uh, it has this kind of swivel cover, um, which is kind of unique. So that's why I have this phone. This is 2002. So yeah, you definitely can't use it anymore, but it has a pretty cool design. Later, Motorola actually released a phone called the Motorola Aurora, which is a luxury device that kind of took inspiration from this design. But of course, I don't have that one because that one's really expensive. But yeah, Motorola V70 there, at least 2002. And then this is a Fossil Abacus, which is technically the first smartwatch that ran um, an operating system. So this actually ran Palm OS, believe it or not. This came out way back in 2003. And yes, ran Palm OS for a watch like this, to run like a full-blown mobile operating system is is pretty unique for the time so yeah that's why I have the Palma Abacus, a fossil abacus here running Palm OS this was released back in 2003 a lot of people might th not think of fossil as a uh, technology company but they did make some pretty cool innovations for the smartwatch sector this was like way before Apple watch right all right next up this is the Sony Clie NX70 released in 2004 I believe ran Palm OS and uh, yeah I can see QWERTY keyboard here um, clamshell design and uh, PDA functions this is not a phone this is a PDA and you can actually twist the display so you can twist the display and then there's your familiar palm kind of form factor right here right so yeah it's basically a, a palm like device or handspring type of device with a QWERTY keyboard Optional QWERTY keyboard should you choose to use it. You can also use a stylus, of course. Also had like a built-in camera and stuff like that. Anyways, this is a PDA from 2004. Then we kind of have the successor, uh, first the Sharp Saurus and the Sony Clie. Both of these are fairly similar. Uh, the Sony Clie, um, they have similar designs, but the Sony Clie runs Palm OS. The Sharp Saurus runs Linux. So that's the major difference, and the keyboard is, is different as well but the form factors are kind of similar. They both released the same year, 2004. So yeah, um, out of the two, I like this, this Sharp Saurus a little bit better. But yeah, the Sony Clie, this is the UX50, I believe. The UX50 released 2000, was this one 2004? Okay, this one must have been a little bit later then, maybe 2004, 2005. Um, anyways, this is actually a bit smaller than the other Sony Clie and has like kind of a laptop clamshell form factor. Uh, pretty cool though. Has a stylus, scroll bar, cord keyboard. You can rotate the screen as well, make this into like a tablet thing. And uh, yeah, it is a PDA RAM Palm OS. Sharp Saurus, kind of similar form factor. Has a cord keyboard, scroll wheels. Uh, you can twist the display as well, just like with the, the Clie. Except this one ran Linux. I think this one has a smoother operating system of the two. I actually did a video comparing the two. Um, and yeah, otherwise just a really cool like this mini clamshell laptop form factor. This is pretty cool. So yeah, these two devices released, I think 2004 to 2005. This is a C3, C1000 model, I believe. So I think the, the difference was the other models had like different hard drive sizes or something like that. I think this was a C1000, only released in Japan, so it is kind of rare. All right, next up we have the Nokia N-Gage, also released in 2004. This is the original N-Gage. I also have the N-Gage QD. Um, so this one released a little bit later, I think 2005, but yeah, both N-Gages right here. Uh, the N-Gage was an interesting device because it's kind of like the first time that, uh, smartphones or phones actually could play mobile games, right? Like real mobile games. This was way before the smartphone. So yeah, Nokia was the first to kind of, uh, go in on that industry, I guess. So they, they made a phone that could play mobile games, kind of like a Game Boy, or Game Boy Advance. And uh, they released separate cartridges for it and stuff like that. Kind of an innovative concept for the time. Um, they were kind of ahead of their time in that sense because now mobile games are kind of, you know, really dominating and really popular. Back then, mobile games, like, it was basically like the Game Boy and stuff like that. But nobody thought about playing games on a phone. So that's when the N-Gage came in. N-Gage QD, um, just different design. I think they might have updated the specs a little bit. But for the most part, not that different from the engage in capabilities. I actually like the form factor and this design of the original engage better than the uh, QD. The QD just doesn't look as inspired. But yeah, 
came out, this came out 2004, this came out, um, I think a little bit later, 2005 or a year later or something like that. But yeah, the N-Gage, really, really cool devices that kind of forgotten now, but um, back then they were like the first phones to play like real games. Um, <laughs> like non, like, the other ones could just play like really, really simple games. These ones kind of like took in their own cartridges and played games like that, so that was pretty cool. Alright, props to Nokia. Another phone by Nokia, 3250, this came out in 2005. Um, yeah, I have this phone just because it's uh, also pretty unique. It has a twisting kind of mechanism here, so uh, it's a music player on the back and then has a camera as well. So you could actually twist this like this, right? And then, hey, I want to play my music, and now you have uh, music controls, so you can, uh, you can twist it like that, so depending on what kind of form factor you want. So now, like, if you want to take video or uh, take pictures, you can hold it like a camcorder. So that's pretty unique for the time, and uh, I like I love Nokia because they experimented so much in the 2000s. So that's why I have a lot of Nokia devices. They really experimented, especially in the mid 2000s. So yeah, that's a 3250 from 2005. Kind of a cool phone that has like dedicated music controls. Something that they will, they will revisit later with the Express Music 5700, which I don't have. I used to have that one. All right, last on this row is the Palm TX. Palm TX released 2005. Uh, ran Palm OS. Obviously, it's a Palm device, and um, this one is just what you would think of when you think of a Palm device. It's just a standard PDA form factor. You need a stylus to use it, um, and then it takes in handwriting and stuff like that. Resistive touchscreen, um, but yeah, it's a it's a Palm Pilot, uh, but it's the latest version. I think this was one of the last versions, the Palm TX. So this was released in 2005, right when Palm Pilot started dying. Um, after 2005, I don't think really many people bought. Palm Pilots. So this was kind of the last hurrah uh, for Palm, because after this moment, um, most people just started using like phones and smartphones, right? So yeah, this is kind of when PDA started dying, was like the mid-2000s, but this was kind of the last real uh, dedicated Palm device before they released the Palm Trio, right? So yeah, 2005, Palm TX. Alright, the second row is when things really start to get interesting, and I think that uh, phone design really starts to become more and more diversified. So first product I have here, this is not a phone, this is an MP3 player, um, but I have sentimental value attached to this. This was released in 2006, it's the Creative Zen Vision M, and this was my main music player when I was in college. So I have really a lot of good memories attached to this device because it got me through many stressful times, right, studying for exams and things like that. So this was a really good music player for the time, it played like virtually any file format of the period, like it played... Um, uh, AVI files, which was important back then, and like DivX and XFID encoded files, that was also pretty important. Um, so yeah, I watched a bunch of shows, anime shows on this tiny little screen. Uh, really good music player as well, even had an FM transmitter, I think. So yeah, Creative Zen Vision M, good music player for the time. This is a hard drive based, of course, from 2006. Then next up we have, this is um, the HTC Universal, but it's also called the iMate Jazz Jar. This was also released in um, 2006. And as you can see, it's like a PDA. It's also a phone. So it's, it's an interesting phone because it's like this clamshell form factor. But uh, I think a lot, of, a lot of companies kind of experimented with design back then. So this is, yeah, type, kind of like a PDA phone hybrid device, if you can call it that. So yeah, had a QWERTY keyboard, uh, you can call people from this thing, and had like a kind of mini laptop PDA form factor. You can rotate the screen just like you could on the Sharp Saurus and the Sony Clea, except this actually made calls, so this was actually a phone. Um, so yeah, pretty interesting device. I think it released 2005, 2006. This is the iMate Jazz Jar or the HTC Universal. Then up next we have a device that I think is really cool as well, and a lot of people may know is the T-Mobile Sidekick 3 or the Danger Hip Top 3. Um, this is also kind of a, it's a phone that's a messenger device and get the swivel action going. Let me show you guys that, right? The classic um, open, when you open a T-Mobile Sidekicks. So, uh, hard to do with one hand. Okay, here we go. There we go. <laughs> so, there's a swivel screen, um, of course, to open it up and you get this lovely QWERTY keyboard and it ran a custom operating system, but yeah, this is basically what the kids used back then to 
what the cool kids used back then to communicate with people. They used MSN Messenger, AIM on the go, and the T-Mobile Sidekick is what they used. So this is Sidekick 3 from 2006. Probably the best iteration of the bunch IMO. Alright, now this is a Sony Ericsson P990, pretty unique device because you have this uh, numpad right here you can use to call people with, right? And then you can open it up, and there, you got a QWERTY keyboard that's really tiny and small. I think that's why they actually have a stylus. <laughs> you have a stylus because you need a stylus to press the, the keys here. They're so small. But again, pretty unique form factor and design. Got to give props to Sony Ericsson. I think this ran Palm OS or Symbian, was it? It was a Symbian Palm OS, I forget, but it ran like a smartphone-ish operating system. And uh, yeah, so you have the dual flip design, which you don't really see in many phones, right? You have the keypad and the QWERTY keyboard design, so very cool, Sony Ericsson, 2000, 2006, I think. All right, also from 2006, we have the Windows. Remember when uh, Windows XP had the Media Center edition? So they also had a mobile initiative called the um, Portable Media Center. And they had a few devices which ran the Portable Media Center. And the Philips, this is one of them. This is actually one of the rarest devices that ran that. I think most of the time you saw the Creative Zen or the iRiver devices. But the Philips you don't really see very often. So I managed to snag this one. This is kind of unique because it has like a mini TV form factor. Has like a, actually has an AV in, which is very unique for the time. You can record from uh, your DVD players and stuff like that. So very unique device. Um, again, PMC, the Portal Media Center, is basically, think of it like the Windows version of iTunes, right? So this basically is like a portable media player device, but it has restrictions. So it wasn't as good as like, say, the Creative Zen was that I showed earlier, right? So the Creative Zen could play like almost any media file. You, you really didn't have to go through some proprietary stuff, but I think this one you did because it's running what Windows... Um, portable media center operating system which is like a modified version of Windows CE and because of that you had to run WMV and WMA files so you had to convert everything to that so that kind of sucked but yeah a relic of the time man Philips made a portable media center <laughs> device that could play movies and stuff so it's from 2006 all right so this is a Palm Trio I think this is the 650 or the 700 uh, but yeah this is basically what Palm went into after the PDA started not to become any more popular because um, people started switching to smartphones. Uh, so this was Palm's take on the smartphone, the Palm Trio. Very popular actually back in the day. This was back when, back before the iPhone, you got to remember, the Trio was actually one of the more popular smartphones of the time. So you can see, think of it as competing with the Blackberries, the Motorola Qs, the uh, Samsung Blackjacks of the time. So the Trio was actually quite popular for the time. Um, well, relative speaking, because it's not like smartphones was really popular at that time, but but still, among smartphone users of the time, this was competing with BlackBerry and probably held its own. So yeah, Palm Trio from 2006. Um, this was a very, this is a very dated design, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> the QWERTY keyboard and everything. Classic dated design, the pre-iPhone smartphone design. All right, and you even had the, uh, yeah, and you even have the antenna, right? <laughs> how, how long has it been since you've seen a phone with an antenna? So you can tell that that's, this phone is pretty old just based on that. All right, so you have another unique phone here, this, the Nokia E70. This phone, um, again, you saw that flip action. This is a really cool phone from 2006. Had the numpad, right? And then this runs Symbian OS, so it's kind of like a pseudo smartphone operating system. So if you want to do some texting and messaging, you just flip it open like this, and then you can text with both hands, because now it's a QWERTY keyboard. So. Still a very, very unique design. I haven't really seen anyone else try it. So yeah, the Nokia E70, also very unique unique design and a unique take on um, the input devices. That's what I like about phones from the mid-2000s is that they really experimented a lot. So yeah, the E70 from 2006. Then we have another messenger device. This is the Zip It Z2 Messenger, um, I think also from 2007. Very, I think kind of similar to the Sidekick in that you emphasize like you would connect to your, like AIM or MSN or Yahoo and then you would send your friend messages and stuff like that. So this one is in a clamshell design. I don't think this is a phone. It's not really a phone. It's really only used for messaging. So yeah, you can tell there's no um, there's no call buttons or anything like that. It's just a QWERTY keyboard. So really this this device is really cool because it it's, it's like a capsule, a time capsule. It existed only 
for messaging. <laughs> you know, now it seems kind of weird, but back then there were no like messaging apps, right? Everyone had to use the, de the desktop messaging apps. So there's devices that existed specifically for that, like the Ogo Messenger and um, the Sidekick. Um, there's a bunch of other messenger devices, but the Zipit was one of them. So yeah, this is from 2007, uh, relic of the time. Pretty cool. Next up, we have the iconic Razer, the Motorola Razer 2, actually. This is not the original, this is Razer 2. You can tell because it's thinner. But uh, this is from 2007 or 2008. Um, this is a cool device. Uh, again, very, very slim, very thin. This is why the Razer was very popular when it came out. It's kind of like a fashion phone, right? It's, it's so thin for the time. Like, compare this to the thickness, right, of the other phones of the time. So, this is a very thin, very sexy phone from the time. And, yeah, um, I would say this is a pretty popular phone. Uh, the original is, of course, very iconic, but the Razer 2, uh, I like it as well. Uh, very, very thin design and uh, pretty iconic flip phone. So, yeah, that's from 2007 or 2008. Next up, we have the Nokia N93, which um, this device is also pretty unique. So this is a flip phone, so you can flip it open, and uh, there, shows the, you have the numpad here, right, and then you can make calls just like on any flip phone, but this is, has a camcorder, so people don't remember that Nokia actually used to have really good camera phones, right, for the time, right, so back in the mid-2000s, late-2000s, Nokia actually had better cameras than the iPhones did, so Nokia actually focused on the cameras with the Zeiss lens and everything, and uh, this was specifically meant as kind of a, a camcorder phone. So you can take video with it. So what you would do is uh, you would shoot it like this. You hold it like a camcorder. And then you'd have um, the screen facing you so that you would shoot it uh, in. This is a view. This is kind of like a viewfinder, right? So you can like kind of zoom in, zoom out, take video. Um, and this is a pretty unique design, right? The camcorder design. So yeah. And you can also play it back. On landscape mode right because this screen can also um, go into landscape like this there so yeah this is a very cool phone um, Nokia experimented a lot in the mid 2000s I love that so yeah this one 2007 N93 i actually it's the second revision of the N93 next up we have the uh, communicator I think this is the last of the communicator series it's the E90 so communicator was one of the original phones uh, from the 90s and this one is, so you have the standard phone interface right here, right? You can call people or whatever, right? Then if you want to do business, you wonder how it's so thick, right? <laughs> if you want to do business, you actually just flip it open like this. And bam! There on the inside, another QWERTY keyboard. So now if you really want to do business, you can do business, right? You have a QWERTY keyboard on the inside. And uh, now you can do, so this ran Symbian, right? So actually kind of had like smartphone type of stuff in it. Um, there's like games and stuff, there's pin functionality, so you can email people and uh, text people just using this QWERTY keyboard. But yeah, it's cool that they have another display, two displays, one display on the front, and then another display on the back, or on the inside, actually. So yeah, you have a display on the front, display on the inside, so that's pretty cool. Nokia E9 communicator from 2007. All right, up next we have the N95, which uh, it's a phone I really wanted back in the day. This is a really cool phone. The N95 uh, was a really powerful phone when it came out because it had a really good camera. This had a Carl Zeiss 5 megapixel camera at the back. Probably like the best camera phone when it came out. So this was a really good phone for just any, just anything, playing media, um, taking pictures. So it's got the standard flip phone design, right? So you can just call people or you can slide it the other way. And now you have the dedicated multimedia buttons for playing um, music and video. So again, Nokia had a lot of good stuff back then. Um, it's thick, but actually at the time it was considered a better phone than the iPhone when it came out. This is the 2007. came out a little bit after the iPhone 1. The iPhone, the original iPhone was introduced. And uh, this phone was considered better at the time because the better specs um, could actually, had a better camera. Remember the original iPhone didn't have a good camera. And uh, this was actually considered a better phone, so. Props to Nokia, this was probably one of their last really good phones, N95 from 2007. All right, and we, here we have a, another T-Mobile Sidekick. This is a Sidekick Slide made by Motorola. Um, I think this, yeah, also 2007. So, yeah, this is a Sidekick Slide. There we go. 
What else can I say about it? It's like the T-Mobile Sidekick, except it's got a sliding interface, which to me isn't as cool as the swivel one, and the keyboard isn't as good either. But, you know, it's uh, it's also smaller, but yeah, it's it's a Sidekick. What else can I say about it it's for, for, me for messaging and stuff? I still think the Sidekick 3 was better. You might be wondering what this big thing is. Uh, this is the HTC Advantage X7500. So this is a phone, believe it or not. You can actually make calls on this thing. It looks like a huge tablet. <laughs> this is probably the biggest phone of the time, right? Um, it, it is massive, right? Uh, <laughs> I can't imagine making calls on this thing. But yeah, it came with this keyboard case and you can dock it like this. And then you can do your work like this, right? This is for business people, right? So you can do your work like this and then I guess you can call people, right? I don't know. I mean, now it might it might be actually better now because you have Zoom and Skype. But back then, I don't I can't really think of any reason why anyone would use a phone this big. It's just maybe if you wanted to have a pseudo tablet kind of thing, um, <laughs> dedicated Internet Explorer button. Come on, I mean, yeah, this is just a really unique device. That's why I have this in my collection. Just massive, just absolutely massive phone and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, look at it. This is the phone. Who would have think that this, this, this is a uh, can make calls the same thing as something like this can, right? <laughs> like the the E ninety to me is a much better interface because this is just too big. Like, who's really going to carry this in their pocket, right? All right, so that's the HTC Advantage X seventy five hundred from two thousand seven. Right on to the third row. Oh, the third row is two thousand eight to two thousand nine. Um, again, a lot of my phones are from 2008 and 2009. There's just a lot of cool phones from that period. All right, uh, this is not a phone. So we're going to start out with these guys. Uh, these two are not phones. They're kind of similar. So we have the Nokia N810 and the Sony Milo 2. Both of these are pretty similar devices. They're not phones, but they're kind of meant as internet browsing devices, I guess. So, yeah, they're sliders. This one even came with a kickstand. Um, this one ran Mamo which is an operating system derived from Linux. Actually, for the time, it had probably one of the best web browsers. So this was really good for browsing the web. That's actually what it was meant for, just browsing the web, because back then, smartphones didn't have good web browsers. So I guess you need to buy a separate device just to browse the web. So <laughs> that's what the N810 was for. Milo was something similar. Um, I mean, you could also play music and, and, and video and stuff like that on these devices too. They're, they're media devices. So yeah, Sony similar thing. You have a web browser, uh, media player. Doesn't make calls, but you can just use it to browse the web. I think what Sony did was they basically took the PSP Go uh, kind of design, and then oh, never mind. Actually, this is this came before the PSP Go, right? Okay. Um, I guess Sony made this first before the PSP Go. So they they thought of this first. They basically just took um, one of their phones, and then they say, well, what if you take out the phone phone functionality, add in the a pretty, this is a mediocre keyboard. I think the Nokia's keyboard is better. Add in a mediocre keyboard, and uh, this is for people who just want to browse the internet or maybe take pictures or, um, I think this did have a camera. Yep. Take pictures or uh, listen to music, uh, just like a multimedia consumption device. So, released this around the same time, 2008. So, both of these from 2008, again, time capsule type of devices. We can't. Can you imagine devices there that that uh, back then you had to have a separate device because the phones back then were so bad at browsing the internet you needed separate devices to do this? <laughs> you needed separate devices just to be able to browse the web comfortably on the go. Alright, anyways, Milo 2 and the N810. And then um, Milo 2, by the way, ran a similar interface to the PS3, which is cool. Next up we have the, this is a Toshiba Portage. What model is this again? Um, G910 or something like that? Something like that. Anyways, this is very similar to the... Kind of similar to the E90, right? It's like a clamshell device that you could call people from the front of it. There's no numpad, but you can flip it open and then you have more functions here. QWERTY keyboard, stuff like that. So it's kind of like a mini version of the E90, I guess. So yeah, um, 2008, I believe. There's a bunch of other devices, actually similar to the HTC Universal as well. Yeah, the Universal didn't have anything on there. Okay, so it's, yeah, similar to the iMate Jazz Jar. A little bit smaller than the iMate Jazz Jar, though. So, um, yeah, this is the Toshiba Portage. I think the G910 or something like that, 2008. Next up, we have the tablet Arco 7. 
Um, so I actually own an Arcos 5 in university. And this thing was actually really cool because you could use it to play a lot of videos and music and stuff like that. It played virtually almost anything, like any file format of the time. And it's kind of like the creative. Um, so you, you didn't really need to convert many things. Some things you did need to convert, but for the most part, it played a lot of different file formats. So I really like this for playing playing videos, right? Because you got to remember, um, back then, you needed to carry a separate device for playing music and movies and video and stuff like that. Because phones just weren't good enough for that back then. So the Arco 7 was probably one of the best. So this device and a hard drive based. So you could store a lot on this device. Guess how much the store is? 320 gigabytes. Yes, I'm not kidding. <laughs> back then, uh, before flash storage, we had rotating hard drives, right? But, you know, flash storage is better. It's faster, but rotating hard drives, you can store a lot more stuff. So you can basically put your entire library of music and movies on this thing. 320 gigs was massive. And you can swap out the batteries too. So that was a cool feature back then. So yeah, Arcos 7, uh, 2008. Arcos was actually one of the big companies that made a lot of these music players back then. It's kind of a shame that Arcos kind of just died off after Android came on the scene. Alright, uh, this is the Samsung U900, I think, yeah. So this is the evolution of a, a phone I had in university. I had the D900. I had the D900 in university and um, this is kind of the evolution of that phone. Again, you can see the numpad is very similar to the Motorola Razr's numpad. So it's very, very thin, right? Very thin, very fashionable type of device. But yeah, um, I have this because of just sentimental values. Like I had a D900 when I was in college. This is pretty much very similar to D900. Uh, a little bit better because it has a touchpad and stuff like that. But um, otherwise, yeah, this is. I think this came out in 2008, right? My D900 was from 2007. So yeah, this is very, uh, it had a 5 megapixel camera. It's actually quite good for the time. So yeah, this is just a very slim slider phone that had sentimental value for me. So that's a Samsung U900. Next up we have the HTC Dream, also known as the T-Mobile G1. This is the very first Android phone released. And uh, this this is just for historical value, right? A lot of people like to collect the very first iPhone. This was the very first Android phone. So yeah, I mean, this ran Android 1.5 or something like that. So again, you have the kind of dated interface, right? Back then, Android actually had the physical buttons here for a call and home and stuff like that. You had a trackpad here. But you still have this unique kind of like sliding, I don't know how to call it, it's not even a sliding display. It's kind of like a swivel type of display. So that's really cool, right? So again, very cool phone. Um, kind of, most. I mostly have it for the historical value, this being the first Android phone. But yeah, this is the T-Mobile, let's see, with Google. The first Android device released back in 2008, the T-Mobile G1. All right, next up we have the iPac. It's the HP iPac 210, one of the last HP iPacs ever released. So this was pretty powerful for the time. Also you can see it's really bulky. And um, you have all these standard Palm Pilot type of buttons here. But yeah, this is a Pocket PC. One of the last kind of dedicated Pocket PCs released. It was pretty powerful for the, for the time, right? Uh, but still, it's, it was going to be outdated by smartphones and it's going to be taken over by smartphones. So this this device really did not have a very long shelf life. Uh, this was released for mostly enterprise users, but, you know, I have it because um, I just want to have Pocket PC and iPack in my collection. This was probably one of the most powerful Pocket PCs and one of the last ones. So I just wanted to have that for the historical value for the collection. But yeah, ran Windows Mobile 6, 6.0. Classic, I think. So yeah, did not make any phone calls. I think this was one of the last devices that ran Windows Mobile Classic. Didn't wait. It's not Windows Mobile, so it didn't make any phone calls. Just had a PDA type of pocket PC interface. Next up, we have the iPhone Nano. Oh, sorry, iPod. <laughs> yep. Uh, this is the iPod Nano, uh, fifth generation. So this is the very last iPod released with a click wheel. I really like the click wheel. I think it's a really cool thing when it was first first came out, you know, I'll go to the Apple store and I would just play around with the click wheels. Wow, it's so cool, right? I can navigate using this, it's so intuitive. And uh, Apple kind of got rid of it um, after 2009. So yeah, this came out in 2009, probably uh, the last iPod to have a click wheel. Um, so yeah, that's why I have this one. Also, it's a video recorder as well. 
That was to compete with the pocket camcorders back then, like the Flip Video, Flip Video Mino, and stuff like that. Remember, back then you had to carry you had to carry all these dedicated devices because smartphones just weren't good enough back then. But yeah, this is tiny, and I was the last device to have a click wheel, so it's pretty cool. So yeah, this iPack, the HP iPack 210, one of the last iPacks ever released back in 2008. And then the iPod Nano 5th generation, the last iPod with a click wheel, released in 2009. So next up we have the MS Zune HD. So um, the Zune HD was not very popular because the iPod was just so dominant, right? And uh, Microsoft wanted the Zune to compete with the iPod, but you know, obviously that didn't work, kind of failed. But still, a lot of people to this day, myself included, we like the Zune HD. I think the Zune HD is actually a pretty cool device. It's super tiny, very small, very light, um, portable flash player. Originally meant to compete with the iPod Nano, um, but it had a really cool interface. This interface was actually a predecessor of the Windows 8 Metro interface. So it was actually very, very fluid and um, I liked it. So yeah, the Zune HD, I'm kind of a forgotten music player now, but um, for me, I think many others, there's still kind of a cult following for uh, Zunes, because Zunes were actually quite good. Um, it's just that people never really gave them a chance because they weren't iPods. All right, uh, now, uh, next up we have a device very similar to the Toshiba Protégé that we saw earlier. This is the LG M-Touch. Um, yeah, basically, if you compare this to the Protégé, very, very similar, right? Uh, even ha It has a display in the front, or well, this one didn't really have that, but still, yeah, kind of like the E90, kind of like the Portage. Very similar design, and yeah, basically you have full screen in the front, it's an Android device, and uh, you have the call buttons here, and then if you have the QWERTY keyboards, you know, to do your texting and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think it's just a very similar device. I think the Portage ran uh, Windows Mobile, though. This one, Windows Mobile, the LG M Touch ran uh, Android. So that's a key difference. And then this one, this is the Sharp Sidekick LX2009. So this one came out, I think, yeah, this is, these are all like 2009 now. So we went through the 2008s already. <laughs> so yeah, the Sharp Sidekick LX, uh, it's a sidekick. I mean, what can I say? But it has the swivel screen, right? So the swivel displays back. And then you have the kind of better QWERTY keyboard compared to the Sidekick slide. So I like this one better than the Sidekick Slide because it brought back the swivel display and I like the keyboard better. Um, I still think the T-Mobile Sidekick 3 was a classic original one, but this one is obviously more updated. It came out three years later, so it has all the technology, te technical upgrades and stuff like that. So anyways, that's the uh, Sharp Sidekick 2009 LX. So another cool device, but it's a Sidekick. I've already talked about that already. All right, next up. Um, also 2009, this is the rest of these all 2009. Samsung Exclaim, unique thing about this phone is uh, slides up and also slides the other way. Yes, it's a dual slider, so you have your regular slider interface, this is for making calls, you have your numpad, and then it's like, oh, I want to do some texting as well. So then you flip it open, and then you can do some texting with the QWERTY keyboard right here. So yeah, this is a really cool concept to have a dual slider design. So, Samsung Exclaim, and then we have the Sony uh, Ericsson, this is the W995, which is, um, sorry, this phone is very fragile. <laughs> but this had one of the best cameras at the time. It's an 8 megapixel camera. So Sony phones usually have pretty good cameras. So this 8 megapixel camera and Walkman branded, right? So you gotta remember, Sony was relying a lot on its Walkman brand. So this has been a Sony Ericsson released a uh, line of Walkman phones. They also released a line of CyberShot phones. So the W995 is kind of combining both. Has all the, the good cameras and good camera specs of the CyberShot line, as well as the uh, music focused uh, controls of the Walkman line. So you can see it has dedicated, dedicated um, media controls on the side as well, as well as a dedicated shutter button. So this phone actually had a lot of functionality. Um, so that's why I have this phone. It's kind of like the last Walkman phone. And also the last Cybershot phone, you can see it's got the Cybershot branded right there as well. So Cybershot and Walkman branded. So this is kind of the last phone in that line, so it's kind of cool. Slider phone, of course. Uh, next up we have the Nokia E72. Kind of looks like a Blackberry. Um, it's basically, yeah, like a Blackberry, except it ran Symbian instead of Blackberry OS. So yeah, what can I say? This is a very, very durable phone. Uh, a lot of people from business users, I think, would appreciate this phone. 
So I guess if you, for whatever reason, you didn't want a BlackBerry at the time, then you have the, uh, then you have this option, right? You have the E72. So yeah, this is a pretty pretty interesting device. Um, I like the color too. It's a very cool, interesting color scheme. You can tell that the materials and everything are very well made. So I guess this is your BlackBerry alternative. Next up, we have the Nokia uh, N900. This ran MAMOS, the same as the Nokia N810, and this is actually a successor to the N810. Except compared to the N810, this one has a better camera, of course. Uh, better camera, and it's also a phone, right? The other one wasn't a phone, it was just for internet browsing. So, uh, yeah, this is basically just an upgrade in every way. Uh, the keyboard is better, screen is better, the camera is better, um, and it takes phone calls. So, uh, I think it's just a better upgrade than the N810 in every way. So, the N8, not the N900. I only have the N810 uh, as kind of a time capsule thing because that's an internet appliance. <laughs> um, you don't really see many of those devices, but the N900 is probably the one you want if you're uh, picking between the two. All right. Then next up we have the HTC Touch Pro 2. Uh, this is also a landscape slider phone, ran Windows Mobile 6.5. Um, and I think that's why I have this device, it's because it's the only device I have here that ran Windows Mobile 6.5. I think I used to have a Sony Xperia X2 as well, but the X2 is kind of hard to find now. So yeah, this is the Touch Pro 2. Ran um, Windows Mobile 6.5, but had a cu custom interface on it because it's HTC. So they have their custom uh, interface on top of that, um, but yeah, I think it's just for the interface. That's why I have that phone. All right, um, and next we have the PSP Go. It's not a phone, but I have this because it was released around the same time. Also a mobile device, so that's why I have it here. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of ahead of its time because this was way before people bought uh, digital media, right? So the PSP Go is like it's all digital. You, there's no physical UMD drive or anything like that. This is way before everyone just, you know, did digital downloads. So this is kind of ahead of its time. Um, I still think it's one of the cooler devices because you can actually hack it and you can make it run emulators and stuff like that. So the PSP Go is still pretty cool. And um, I think it's very similar to the Sony Xperia Play, which you'll see um, coming up. So, yeah, I did a video comparing this to the Xperia Play. But yeah, PSP Go ahead of its time, pretty cool. Uh, then we have the Samsung Alias 2, still a pretty unique phone. Uh, Mr. Mobile actually did a video on this one as well. So it's a flip phone, but it also has an e-ink keyboard. This e-ink keyboard means that it could actually change depending on what you were using. So yeah, if you were using this for calls, stuff like that, it's a numpad. But if you were to use it in landscape mode, which you can do, so landscape mode and you want to text people, this will change to a QWERTY keyboard. And I already did a video on this, but very cool phone. Um, I, I don't think anyone else really explored that e-ink concept, so this is a very, very unique device. Um, this keyboard, I, I don't think anyone else really explored it. So props to Samsung, they made a really cool device. So this is the Alias 2 from 2009 with the dynamic e-ink keyboard. This is way before, you know, like people thought about using touch screens for everything. Uh, this is just a really cool device at the time. So yeah, that's it for the third row. Alright, on to the fourth row now. So. Fourth row has, um, this is not a phone, but it is a device, which is kind of interesting. Uh, this is a wiki reader. So this device is mainly just meant to read Wikipedia articles offline. And why would you want to do that? Well, I guess if you're going to like a really poor country or <laughs> you're uh, living offline, off the grid, then I guess you might want this. Um, I guess if you're traveling, you don't have any access to internet. Um, Maybe those are some reasons, but yeah, this, this device is only meant to uh, read Wikipedia articles offline. So it has to be updated like every year, basically. But yeah, that's all it does. It's like an e-reader that only reads Wikipedia articles, which is kind of interesting. That's why I have it. Um, so the, all these devices are from 2009 to 2013. So these ones, uh, this is actually from 2000. Yeah, this is actually from 2009, but I put in this row because there's no space um, on the third row. But yeah, starting from here, it's now 2010. So this is a BlackBerry Torch uh, 2. So BlackBerry Torch 2, uh, this is the slider version of the classic BlackBerry Bold. And uh, this is a, it's a cool design. I mean, it's a, it's a slider, so everyone knows about this design, but it's also a BlackBerry. So I guess a lot of business users now have the option 
um, to use this as a touchscreen device, which by the way, BlackBerry switched to touchscreens after 2008, right? But this is a lot better than the BlackBerry Storm. That was a terrible touch uh, phone, but the Torch 2 is a much more improved version of that. So yeah, you have a slider BlackBerry. So it's for business users back then. Uh, which ran BlackBerry OS, which is actually quite good for the time. Uh, next up we have the Koan. Uh, this is, which model? V5W. Yeah, this it's called the V5W. Let's see if we can get that. Come on. Oh, here we go. Okay, so V5W. Um, this is kind of interesting because this device, really hard to find now, but uh, it's you can find it in Korea. I actually got this from Korea. And this ran Windows CE. So not a lot of PMPs back then ran Windows CE which means you could actually run a lot of different applications on it other than just the stock ones. So you can install your own kind of applications on this since it runs Windows CE, it's embedded. So you can install any embedded application on this, which is kind of cool. So uh, yeah, basically it's a PMP in other words, but it runs its own operating system. And if you look at this compact flash slot. <laughs> That's uh, actually, was this a compact flash? I think this might be, I think it's too big to be an SD card, so it has to be compact flash, but yeah. That's a Windows CE based PMP, so obviously you can play all your movies, music, video, and stuff like that. But also had like an English, I think this also had like an English study application or something like that in a dictionary. So a bunch of stuff you can do with that device. All right, next up we have a really cool device from 2010. This is the Motorola Flipout. So Motorola actually made, a, this is an Android device. So this is a phone, believe it or not. It is a phone that can take pictures and stuff and runs Android. So it has the capacitative Android home buttons that were common at the time. I think this was Android 2.3, gingerbread or something like that. But yeah, you flip it open, then you have a really small, tiny, QWERTY keyboard you can use to type messages to people and emails or something like that, social media. But yeah, just a really, really cool design that I haven't really seen anyone else do since. Even like a small D-pad right here. Like how cool is that, right? Just a <laughs> It's a tiny device that has like a tiny QWERTY keyboard, so that's really cool. The Motorola flip out. And then we have another T-Mobile, not, technically not a T-Mobile though. It's labeled a T-Mobile, but it's really not, because it's not running Danger OS, it's running Android. So this is the T-Mobile 4G, um, the Sidekick 4G, right? Yeah, it's a Sidekick, but it's not really a Sidekick, because it doesn't run the uh, Sidekick operating system, it runs just Android. It only uses the Sidekick name. But um, in other words, it's a standard Android phone with a QWERTY keyboard that kind of has this tilt-up display. Um, but other words, it's not really nothing like a Sidekick. It just, I guess it kind of has the interface of a Sidekick, right? The physical, I mean the physical interface of a Sidekick because it has these buttons here. But the operating system is just Android. So in other words, this is just like a standard QWERTY texting phone of the time, which you had a lot of back then. You had the Motorola Droid, right, which was really popular back then. But uh, yeah, I have this because this is technically the last device that was branded a Sidekick. Next up we have the Sony Xperia Play, which I think is still a really cool device. Like I said, it's kind of like a PSP Go, except it's a phone. So you can use this to call people and it runs Android, right? Runs, um, I think it was Gingerbread 2.3. So yeah, you can install all your Android apps, um, do all those things, you know, do social media, take pictures with the camera. But it also has gaming controls, so you can use this to play uh, emulators, and that's actually a pretty good device for um, for emulators as well. And you can use it to play PSP games and stuff like that, if you have them. Um, <laughs> you can use an emulator for them. But yeah, still, I think still this device is used by some people as probably the one of the best devices to play emulator games. Although it's getting really old now, so they really haven't. I think there's better devices for this now, like the GPD and um, JXD and stuff like that for playing emulator games. But I know there's still probably some people that still use their Xperia Play. If you really want to just play, you know, simple games and stuff, and Android 2.3 probably has the app for it, then you can still use this phone for emulators. All right, next up we have the Sony Tablet P. And I think this device is really ahead of its time. This came out in 2011, but it was at a time uh, when Sony thought, Sony was coming out with some pretty cool devices, and they thought that uh, what if people what if people wanted to fit a tablet in their pocket, right? 
and hey, guess what? It's 2020, and now people are carrying folding phones, right? <laughs> Galaxy Fold, Galaxy Fold 2, the Microsoft Surface Duo. Um, but this, Sony thought of this idea way back in 2011. This was running Android uh, 3. This was running Honeycomb, right? So this was way before the folding concept uh, of phones really started to uh, appear, right? So, you know, this is a folding design. Technically, this is a folding it's a folding tablet. This is like way before the Surface Duo, right? This is like nine years before that, before the, the concept of that, or uh, eight or nine years before the concept of that came out. But still, it didn't work because people were just weren't ready for it. The software wasn't ready for it. Like Android Honeycomb really wasn't a good um, Android version, right? That's why you don't really see Android Honeycomb anymore, like three. Android 3 devices, there weren't that many of them. Um, they were basically only tablet, uh, restricted to tablets. And uh, I have to say this is one of the more unique devices, right? The fact that it's basically one of the first folding tablets, right? You can fit it in your pocket, kind of. It's still kind of big, but anyways, you can fold it out like this. And you, can do st do start, you can do different things on these two screens, just like you can with the Surface Duo now. So Sony was really ahead of their time in making this concept. And you can also prop it up like this to make it um, like a... I use this as an alarm clock, actually. For, for some years. I think one year I did use it as an alarm clock. So yeah, you can just prop it up like this, have like the display show something here, then you can have like a keyboard or something down here, you can have separate applications, something like that. Um, but yeah, really ahead of the time device, the Sony Tablet P from 2011, probably the first folding tablet. So that's pretty cool. Alright, next up we have the Microsoft Kin 2, which isn't too different from the Kin 1 actually. Um, so long story short is Microsoft bought the company behind the Sidekick, which is called Danger. Um, originally the Sidekicks were called Danger Hip Tops, and they bought the company behind it, and they took the operating system and then they turned it into Kin OS, which is now the... Most people probably don't even know this device exists, <laughs> the Microsoft Kin. It was a failure, but basically I want to say that it's supposed to be a continuation of the Sidekick. It was supposed to be a messenger phone, a uh, messenger type of device, so it had a QWERTY keyboard, it had like... You know, there's emoticon stuff. Um, it was basically meant to be the successor to the Sidekick, but uh, Microsoft really failed with it. So, just a cool device for collectors, though, is that, you know, Microsoft did make something like this, right? They made a messenger phone and they failed. That's a, that's a Microsoft Kin 2. 2011, and then next up we have the Nokia E7, which has the slider type of design. Um, this is this actually I want to say that this is the exact same des uh, design that the FX Tech Pro one uses for their um, for their design but uh, yeah this is the original tilt up um, kind of form factor I think that they took and uh, this is a good form factor I like it um, this tilt up design means that you could actually just lay it down like this to watch a movie or something like that and uh, you don't yeah it's at a good angle for doing that so you can watch media and you can type your emails and stuff like that and this the tilt up screen means that you could easily see it better right instead of just a standard slide up screen if you just see a standard slide up screen like this one right you just lay it flat and you had to hold it if you really want to watch a movie or something like that but yeah the tilt up design is like you can just put this on a table and you can watch like a movie and it's already angled towards you which is kind of um, convenient so I can understand why FX Tech took that kind of design um, so, by the way, guys, I haven't got the FX Tech Pro 1. That's why it's not in this video. But, um, yeah, I might be getting that in the future, and then I'll show that in another video. But, yeah, this is a Nokia E7. Uh, it ran Symbian 3, which is kind of a new version of Symbian that's more optimized for touch. Because uh, the original Symbian operating system wasn't that optimized for touch. So, they, they tried to make it more optimized for touch, which is Symbian 3. Um, didn't really succeed with it. I think they went with the Memo instead, and that turned into Mego, uh, which is the Nokia N9, which I don't have, um, because that became selfish OS. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyways, this is uh, the E7 with the cool tilt-up slider design that ran Symbian 3. Alright, next up we have, uh, this is the HP Pre 3, so this is the last of the Pre devices, so if you guys remember, they're Palm, before Palm died, or was bought by HP, they released... Um, a line of phones called the Palm Pre, right? So some people had the Palm Pre, and it was actually a pretty good device for the time. It ran WebOS, so WebOS was actually kind of the success, the predecessor to a lot of the features you see in Android and iOS these days. So the card-based system and stuff like that. 
um, the pull down from the top. A lot of that was taken from WebOS. So WebOS was actually a very influential operating system. Now LG owns WebOS and you actually can use it on the smart TVs. But back then WebOS was actually a smartphone operating system. So it's actually pretty good for a time. Um, it was kind of a, a pioneering op smartphone operating system that kind of got shut down by, H2, by HP. But yes, HP made the Pre-3, this was the last Pre device. Um, it's not Palm branded. Palm was Palm branded the first Pre and the second Pre, but then HP, after they bought it, they branded the third Pre. So this is the last Pre device, it's a slider device. It runs WebOS, it was a good phone, but uh, didn't get any traction because HP discontinued um, all the WebOS devices very soon in 2011. So remember the HP touchpad? Yeah, so they discontinued um, all the WebOS devices very, very quickly, and that's why the Pre-3 never really saw any love, unfortunately. Okay, next up we have the BlackBerry. This is actually the BlackBerry Bull 9900, but it's a special edition released by Porsche Design. So this is the Porsche Design BlackBerry P9981. This is the first collaboration that they did. I think still their best collaboration because they actually put a lot of thought into, um, I mean, just look at the keys, right? It just looks really unique and cool. Uh, the PP92, um, the 9982, sorry, and 9983, I don't think were as, uh, they didn't change as much as the P9981 did. So, yeah, I think the P9982 and 9983 were just rebranded Blackberries with like a leather back, <laughs> basically. Uh, whereas the P9981, this one, they actually redid the keyboard and everything. So, this is actually kind of cool. So, yeah, um, Porsche design, they have a unique, you know, leather back as well. And they have the name, you can see the, the model number here. This is a limited edition, of course. Uh, they sold for quite a lot back then because it's Porsche Design branded. Now, Porsche Design, of course, BlackBerry isn't popular anymore or they are they're not. They don't really exist <laughs> in the mobile phone sector anymore. So they, they actually partner with Huawei now. So you'll see a lot of Huawei branded uh, Porsche Design Mate devices and stuff like that. But uh, I still think that their first collaboration, which was with BlackBerry, this one was still the coolest. Right, I mean, it's just a cool looking phone and this was basically the BlackBerry Bold, it's just a redesigned version and still runs BlackBerry OS 7 and all the cool stuff that came with that OS. That was actually a well received OS. I know many people loved using the BlackBerry Bold 9900, so this is basically just a reskin version of that. So it's a cool phone. Um, used by a lot of business users at the time, this was when BlackBerry was on top of their game. Um, still, right. Alright, next up we have the LG Nexus. Um, this is the LG Nexus 5, released in 2013. So we kind of made a jump here, 2011. I don't have any devices from 2012. Um, I didn't think that there was any interesting devices from that year. So anyways, I went straight to 2013. What's special about the Nexus 5? Well, nothing actually special stock, right? I actually modified this to run Ubuntu Touch OS. So I had a video showing that. So that's why I have this device. Not because of anything interesting about its stock. Uh, I mean, it obviously was the showcase for the new version of Android, um, but I just put Ubuntu Touch OS on it because it's one of the few phones that can actually run it. So that's why I have that. Then the Nokia Lumia 1020, I did a video on this too. This is a really cool device because it emphasized the camera. Like I got this camera grip for it. This was optional, but really shows you that this, this device had one of the best cameras of the time. 41 megapixel Carl Zeiss uh, lens on this camera and uh, just a really good camera for the time, 2013, right? It ran Windows Phone 8, um, so this was back when you had Windows Phone, right? And Nokia was pretty much uh, the only company, um, before they were actually bought by Microsoft, they were the only company that kind of ran Windows Phone. Um, <laughs> so that was, that's, kind of, that's kind of why this is not so popular, right? You would think a, a phone back in 2013 with a 41 megapixel camera would be more popular, the reason is because of Windows Phone, so yeah, that's kind of how Nokia just started dying, unfortunately. This is kind of the beginning of the end for Nokia. Even though they still made good devices, it's just they, they latched onto Windows Phone. That was a problem. They should have stuck with Android, So, which is what they're doing now, right? Nokia is now an Android device uh, company, but back then they kind of chose the wrong OS, <laughs> the wrong company to stick with. But yeah, still a really cool phone for the time just because of the camera. All right. What's this big thing here? This is a tablet. This is the NVIDIA Shield Portable. So uh, I still have the NVIDIA Shield like tab, what is it? Pro? Yeah, NVIDIA Shield Pro, not the tablet. Um, I still have the, the Pro for my TV, right? So me and my friends still use that for streaming Netflix and 
Amazon Prime and things like that. But this was actually the Nvidia Shield's first device, the portable. And this came out in 2013. It was a tablet. Still a pretty good device for emulators. Uh, this I know this better devices that came out, GPD, you know, the JXD, all the Linux devices that came out, all the retro gaming devices that came out. But the great thing about the Shield I still like about it is the, the controls are really well built. Um, these analog controls and the face buttons, they're just so satisfying to press. It's just quality stuff, right? Um, still to this day, when I look at a lot of GPD devices and other Chinese made um, devices or Chinese company, uh, companies that make these retro devices, they're still not as good as the Nvidia Shield. This came out seven years ago, right? And I know that some people still use this device for retro gaming because the controls are just so solid, right? I mean, it's a big device. It's heavy, it's cumbersome, it still runs Android 4.2, which is really old. Um, but, you know, the quality controls here, it's just... Still, I haven't really seen many devices that have really good, um, you know, retro gaming devices that have these kind of controls. So, anyways, props to NVIDIA Shield Portable. This came out way back when. Uh, it was only meant to be an Android tablet, but a lot of people used it for emulators, including me. All right. So moving on to the fifth row here. This is uh, now we're looking at devices from 2014. All right, so 2014, what do we got? Let's start with the Neptune Pine. So Neptune Pine uh, is not a very popular device because this is kind of an indie company or a Kickstarter company or something. Um, but yeah, I think this was their only device that they released. Um, I know that they had, they had like another one, uh, but they didn't release it. So yeah, this device still to this day, I think the smallest Android device, <laughs> this is a phone. So this might be still the smallest Android phone. I mean, I know I had the Jelly Phone, which, by the way, I don't have the Jelly Phone in this collection because I'm getting the Jelly Phone 2. That will actually come out later uh, th later this year, and then I'll do a video on that. But that's why you don't see the Jelly Phone in my collection right now. Uh, but yeah, the Neptune Pine is still the smallest. I think smaller than the Jelly Phone, smaller than the Pom Pom. Um, this is still the smallest Android phone. It's, just, it's tiny. It was originally meant to be a smartwatch or something like that. Uh, ran Android 4.4. Uh, jelly bean um, so yeah it was definitely the smallest Android device of the time and still one of the smallest Android devices today which makes it really cool right? I mean it has a camera ran Android um, <laughs> has a sim card you know just imagine calling someone from this thing it's tiny right it's a really cool device and then the ZT open C uh, this device I have because it runs Firefox OS there you go Firefox OS um, some people may not know that there was Firefox OS, but there was. It died off pretty quickly. But uh, I have this in my collection because there was a time when phones ran this operating system. And it was mostly meant for budget phones, but it was there. It existed. <laughs> so Firefox OS. And then I have the Samsung Z1. Um, it ran Tizen. So this ran Tizen OS. Don't see many phones running that. Again, it's for budget phones, but I have these two because they ran kind of operating systems that many people don't really know about. So Tizen OS and Firefox OS, there there were phones that ran those operating systems, just it's not really common now, right? And then I have another phone that ran a unique operating system. This is the Amazon Fire Phone. So yeah, remember back when Amazon actually made a phone? So I know Amazon, famous for the Kindle Fire and stuff like that, they tried to make a phone which had these different cameras for parallax scrolling and things like that had Firefly, which means you can identify products to buy on Amazon just using the camera. All this stuff was actually really cool and ahead of its time. Um, but Fire OS, I guess people just didn't like it as much as Android, uh, Android when it came to phone stuff. And uh, I think this phone it had a lot of problems when it came out, so a lot of people just gave up on it. And yeah, I gotta say that the apps just, it doesn't compete. Fire OS is a fork of Android, but it doesn't compete with Android and iOS yet. And um, there was problems with the operating system. It's also too expensive for the time. I got this actually pretty cheap, and you can find it really cheap now because not many people bought it. Um, it's kind of a failure. But yeah, I have this in my collection because um, at one time Amazon did make a phone, and you know it failed. So that's actually pretty good for collectors like me, right? All right. So next up, I have the PS Vita Slim. So the PS Vita actually originally came out in 2012, but the Slim version I think came out in 2014. So it's kind of like an updated version that's uh, slimmer, <laughs> like the name says. It's a smaller version, it doesn't have the OLED display of the original PS Vita, um, but it is lighter and more portable, etc. Um, yeah, I like the PS Vita. This was actually my first handheld gaming console. I bought it in Korea, so this model is actually from Korea. This was back when I was living there, back in 2014. 
and a very underappreciated system um, because Sony kind of gave up on it, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> at least in the West. Sony did not give up on it in the Japan, but in the West they kind of gave up on it, and then we only had indie games basically to play on this. But um, yeah, if you go to Japan, PS Vita games, they're plentiful, and then you can still play a lot of PS Vita games. So this mostly became a console that was used for indie games and visual novels and Japanese RPGs and stuff like that. So it's kind of a niche console, but it was, it was really good for the time. I really like the PS Vita. It's a shame that it didn't do that well. Next up, I have the Nintendo 3DS, uh, which I bought the next year in 2015, because this is a new Nintendo 3DS. Um, this is one of the launch covers, Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. Uh, but yeah, this is a new Nintendo 3DS that just came out. Uh, in 2015, and this is when I got it. Again, Nintendo 3DS, um, pretty popular console, more popular than the Vita, uh, obviously, had a lot of good games for it. Um, so I played this, I also played the Vita as well, so I wouldn't say I played one more than the other. I think they both have their really, they both have their game libraries. Um, I think I played the Vita for the visual novels and the indie games and stuff like that. I played the Nintendo 3DS for Nintendo games and, uh, like Capcom games, like the big publishers, stuff like that. So they both have their libraries. So yeah, I like the, the new Nintendo 3DS too. All right, next up we have the BlackBerry Passport Silver Edition. So the original BlackBerry Passport actually came out in 2014. The Silver Edition came out in 2015, uh, which is basically the same device, just with some upgraded aesthetics and a little bit more RAM and stuff like that. Um, still pretty cool device because this is one of the last devices, might be the last device, to run uh, BlackBerry 10. So BlackBerry 10 was kind of the operating system that was intended to compete with iOS and Android, but they failed, right? Because it's really hard to make an operating system to compete with iOS and Android. Um, but you know, BlackBerry tried and they failed, but still BlackBerry 10 was a pretty cool operating system. There's nothing really wrong with it, just like Windows Phone. Uh, Windows Phone also was really good, I think. Had a really fluid interface. It's just because it wasn't iOS and Android, developers didn't want to support it. And same thing with BlackBerry OS X, right? So that means it was kind of doomed from the beginning. Um, but this was a really cool phone. It was actually, like, you can use this landscape mode, use the keyboard to scroll and stuff like that. Like, that was really cool. And the size, the shape of this device is pretty unique. It is the shape of a passport, <laughs> hence the name. So, uh, yeah, it's just a pretty unique device, BlackBerry OS X and the shape and everything is kind of unique, so I have this in my collection. All right, next up we have the Pebble Time Steel. So the Pebble Time Steel was a, is a smartwatch I backed as a Kickstarter. So I think you can see this uh, Kickstarter edition. Yep, Kickstarter backer right there. So yeah, um, Pebble kind of is a company, doesn't exist anymore, but they originally popularized smartwatches. So this was before Apple Watch, before um, all the Samsung Galaxy watches. They kind of made the uh, smartwatches popular, and this they were kind of a small company, so they really could not sustain the business. But you got to give them props for kind of being the pioneers, right? So the Pebble Time Steel kind of um, the watch that was meant to compete with the Apple Watch and the the uh, Android Wear watches, but uh, kind of failed. But it did have better battery life compared to uh, the other smartwatches of the time. I think this one actually ran up to a week. Um, partly because the display wasn't very good. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's part of the reason why I didn't sell as much either, but display was small. Um, this was actually a color version. The original Pebble was actually just black and white. So color version and small display, it, it could run for a, lot, for a while, but I guess people didn't care about uh, battery life all that much because, you know, Apple Watch and uh, Android Wear watches, which you had to charge every day, they sold a lot more. And just Pebble was a small company. They couldn't really compete with them. So yeah, Pebble Time Steel, a uh, really cool device for the time. Uh, I think this was a good smartwatch for the time. It's just Pebble was a small company they couldn't compete, right? Even though they kind of pioneered the smartwatch industry, but they couldn't compete with the uh, Apple Apple watches and Android watches of the time. Next up, we have the Apple iPhone SE. So this came out in 2016. Uh, still a really good phone. I still know many people that use the iPhone SE, the original SE, right? Because this is still one of the best small phones, right? Uh, still to this day, until the until the iPhone 12, which I hope is going to be around the same size, if the iPhone 12 turns out to be around the same size as the iPhone SE, I'm going to get it because I'm still looking for a good phone, kind of like the size of the SE. I really like the size, um, but you know, with updated specs and internals and cameras and things like that. 
So the SE is getting it's it's getting old, right? This came out in 2016. It's it's aging, but a lot of people still use the SE because they like the size of the SE. Um, the new SE that came out this year, um, not really the same because the size is not the same, right? It's the size of the iPhone 8, uh, which is bigger than this. This is based on the iPhone 5s. So a lot of people still like this design. I still like the rectangular design. I still like the size of the iPhone 5s. So that's why I still keep the original SE. So until Apple, maybe the when the iPhone 12 comes out later this year, I'm going to look at the size and if it's going to be um, around the same size as this one, I'm probably going to replace this one. But yeah, until then, this is going to be my standard small phone uh, still, right? Even four years later, there really isn't a good replacement for it. I think there was the XC1 Compact, which I showed in another video. Unfortunately, I sold that phone. But that one still wasn't as small as the SE. The SE was still smaller than the XC1 Compact. And then on the op opposite end of the scale, we got the... <laughs> this is a massive phone, but the HP Elite X3. Yep. So this phone was kind of the swan song for Windows for Windows phones. Um, so this ran Windows 10, and it was one of the last devices to run uh, Windows 10 um, on a phone, right? So this device was also one of the best. So it had all the high-end specs of the time back in 2016. And uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it's kind of sad that people didn't really... People, like I said, it's the same problem with BlackBerry OS, right? Um, people didn't use Windows phones because there wasn't an, an ecosystem for it. Like for iOS and Android, they're huge ecosystems, so many people buy it. Uh, for Windows phones, there isn't really a, a good ecosystem, so it's kind of doomed, right? Just like BlackBerry OS, doesn't matter how good the operating system is, if it doesn't have apps, people aren't going to use it, right? So that's the problem here. HP did try to make a valiant effort. This was probably the best Windows phone ever and one of the last two, probably the last one. And it had Windows Continuum. I showed that in a video. You can actually put this on dock and uh, you can use a monitor with it and a mouse and stuff and it kind of turns into like a desktop, uh, which is really ahead of its time, right? The Continuum feature is really ahead of its time, um, but it's just sad people didn't really give Windows Phone a chance. So yeah, this is the last and best Windows Phone, the HP Elite X3 from 2016. After 2016, Windows Phone was pretty much dead. All right, um, and same with BlackBerry OS too. <laughs> All right, now we get to the last row, which is going to be phones from 2017 until this year, until uh, 2020. All right, so we got the Samsung Galaxy Folder, not the Fold, the Folder 2. So this is a flip phone from 2017. It runs Android. So I think that's the only reason I have it, is that it's a flip phone from 2017 that runs Android. So <laughs> how cool is that, right? Uh, we all thought flip phones were dead, um, but they weren't dead. and you know, this was just three years old and it still ran the, what, Android 6, 7? Um, still ran like a, like a modern version of Android for the time. So definitely there's still people using Android on a modern type of device. Um, or, uh, sorry, people were using modern Android on a traditional flip phone, right, which is an older type of device. Older looking device, but it still ran like a newer operating system. So that's kind of cool, right? So Samsung Galaxy Fuller 2, uh, kind of an a newer flip phone, that's why I have it. Then I have the Apple Watch Series 3, originally released in 2017. Um, this is an Apple Watch and it runs Watch OS. It's the most popular smartwatch out there. Uh, like, compared to all other smartwatches, Apple Watches have sold the most. And it's really, I don't, I'm not really surprised because it's Apple, right? So people are gonna buy Apple products no matter what. And the watch, the Apple Watch is actually pretty nicely designed and implemented, so I can see why a lot of people like it. It's just a pretty useful, um, pretty useful operating system and useful design. And compared to other smartwatches, like there's a big ecosystem for it. Uh, it's really easy to use the apps and things like that. So yeah, why not the Apple Watch Series Three? I have that. All right. Um, next up, I have the Essential Phone. So this is um, the Ocean Depths color which is a really really unique color you can see that it's a kind of like copper and teal so this copper teal color is really unique among phones I don't think I've seen any other phone use this color combination but it's really cool this phone is it's from a small company that was originally headed by Andy Rubin the creator of Android a small startup company and it's kind of sad because I, I really like this company and I really want to back them but they just obviously cannot compete with Apple and Google and Samsung and Huawei, all those behemoths, They're, like small startups for your phones just find it really hard to compete and that's why you won't see FX Tech Pro or the Cosmo Communicator from Planet Computers, you won't find these companies really making, that's why their phones are so expensive, right? 
people are going to ask, why is essential phones so expensive? Why are uh, Planet Computers, FX Tech, why did they make such expensive phones? Because they're from startups, right? So startups can't compete with the big companies. They can't manufacture these on scale. That's why they're so expensive. So yeah, this phone did not get any traction because there's virtually no marketing for it. Um, only like the really the people who are really um, into Android really knew about this device. Um, but most people, they didn't know this device existed, right? Like, if you go to Asia, like, who knows about Essential Phone? <laughs> no one really, because they had virtually no distribution, right? They were, they were just too small of a company, but they had some really good uh, design ideas. Like, this was the first phone to really have this notchless design, um, sorry, this bezel-less design, right? It had this notch, which was actually a really small notch, uh, but they were kind of the first phone to have this bezel-less design. This was way before... Um, phones started going with the bezel-less, right? This was in 2017. That's when phones just started to go with that. But Essential was actually the first one to go with this bezel-less design. It was beautiful, gorgeous. It's just really nice to hold as well because it has a ceramic, um, it uses ceramic and titanium, which is materials that even phones these days, they don't use. Uh, so when I hold this phone in my hand, it feels really hefty. It feels really substantial. So that's another reason I like this phone. It just feels solid. Um, that's something I can't really say about other phones, even today, right? So even today, you won't find phones using ceramic or titanium. It's just stuff that the Essential phone did, I think. In the small details, too. Like, when you charge this device up, it shows, like, a coffee cup being filled. <laughs> like, a Star Starbucks type of coffee cup being filled. Like, just some, like, really cool details like that. This expansion kind of adapter thing that can fit multiple adapters. I think they only released the 360 degree camera and the audio adapter HD for it, but this was also ahead of its time. Yeah, I think Motorola did something similar with the Moto G mods, um, but pretty much that's it. It's, it's meant to be a modular phone, um, but you know, because they didn't really succeed, they didn't really make other uh, attachments for it. But this has now just become a piece of history because this startup company was, I like the Essential phone a lot and I like the company a lot. It's just because they're a startup, they were pretty much doomed for failure in the smartphone industry. So now it's just a collector's piece. Um, Nintendo Switch up here. I think everyone knows about the Nintendo Switch, right? Do I really need to say anything about it? This is a mobile device, so I have it in this collection. But what can I say? It's a Nintendo Switch. It's probably the best console ever made, <laughs> in my opinion, because uh, Nintendo really hit it out of the park with this one. Um, it plays mobile games. Uh, it's also a home console if you dock it in. You can split the controllers to play with your friends. Uh, you can play anywhere. <laughs> there's a lot of good co-op multiplayer games. There's indie games. There's Japanese video, visual novels. There's AAA blockbuster games like Skyrim, Witcher 3, Doom. Like, it just has everything, right? It's like, this console has everything. It has all the games you need. Um, you can play it virtually in every, any way you want to. Like, the best console ever made, in my opinion. All right. And next up we have from 2018, the BlackBerry Key 2, which is actually manufactured by TCL, not by BlackBerry. Um, but it's branded with BlackBerry. So yeah, this is officially the last BlackBerry device released. And um, it's unfortunate, I think they're going to restart production of a new BlackBerry device. I think someone else has taken the license. But until then, this is still the last BlackBerry device. And I really like it. I like the physical keyboard. The keyboard is a lot better than the one on the Key 1. And if you're looking for a physical keyboard phone, you don't really have many options. You have this one from 2018. Then you have the FX Tech Pro 1, which I mentioned already, and the Planet Computers Cosmo Communicator, which I have. But those are kind of bulky devices. And if you really just want like a, a device that you can you know, just use comfortably as a normal phone, then this device is probably the best uh, with a QWERTY keyboard, right? If you want to use this as a normal phone, but you have the option of a QWERTY keyboard, this is probably still better. Um, it's just unfortunate that this was... BlackBerry did not really succeed, um, uh, or at least uh, the newer BlackBerry devices didn't even succeed, even with running Android, right? So this was running Android. Uh, after they switched to Android, they had the Priv, right? The Key 1, the Key 2. Even that kind of failed, so it's kind of sad, right? Like, this is pretty much the last BlackBerry physical device that we, uh, physical keyboard device that we have, which is kind of a shame, because this was a good one. I liked it. I think a lot of people like their Key 2s. Um, there's nothing really, like... They ran mid-range processor specs. Um, I think it's, it was too expensive when it came out. That might be an issue. Um, people saw this as really expensive and didn't really have a good camera, but Blackberries weren't really known for flagship specs or cameras anyways. People used them for the keyboard, and this keyboard did not disappoint. It's actually a really good keyboard. 
But because it's BlackBerry, um, I guess not many people want to buy it. Not many people want to spend that much money for uh, for a phone with mid-range specs. So that's unfortunate. If they just updated this design with like flagship specs and stuff like that, I think it could still still sell well today, right? Like the the keyboard and everything is just really good, and you can scroll with it and everything. The same thing you can do with the Passport, um, and it ran Android, so you can't even blame the operating system anymore. So you have that as well. So, anyways. I hope that BlackBerry will come back and make a successor to the Q2. Alright, next up I have the Sony Xperia XA2. Um, this one I got because I want to run Sailfish 10. So this one is Sailfish X, Sailfish 10, um, which is, is, wait, is that called Sailfish 10? I think I'll just call it Sailfish X for Xperia. I'm getting confused because the iPhone X was the iPhone 10. <laughs> but yeah, I'll just call this the Sailfish X because of Xperia, right? Okay, so I want to run Sailfish X on this phone. That's why I have it. Uh, it's a different operating system. It's the successor to a long line of operating systems dating back to Nokia Symbian 3. So yeah, remember how I said Symbian 3, Nokia's touch successor to Symbian, then they went to Mamo, then they went to Migo, then they went to Sailfish, and then Sailfish 10. Um, kind of the, yeah, the uh, still it's it's kind of still maintained by some former Nokia employees I think um, by uh, what's that company called Hola Yo Hola or something like that Hoya I don't know how to pronounce it Yola anyways that company has uh, some former Amigo uh, developers and Nokia employees that kind of maintain Sailfish uh, which is actually a cool operating system uh, just most people don't know about it right the common public the you know typical person doesn't know anything about Sailfish. They just know iOS and Android, that's it. So Sailfish is kind of a obscure operating system. It's, it's a niche operating system, but there's still like a dedicated group of people that kind of like to use it. So it's kind of like Lineage OS. That's another operating system I tried. Ubuntu Touch. Um, these other operating systems that are kind of niche, but there you have a dedicated following. So anyways, I have Sailfish X on this one. So that's why I have it. Next up, I have the Pom Pom, uh, which I did a video on comparing this to the Jelly Phone. Um, again, I don't have the Jelly Phone in this video because I'm waiting for the Jelly Phone 2. Uh, so I sold the original Jelly Phone, waiting for the Jelly Phone 2, which I backed on Kickstarter, should be here uh, probably end of this year, early next year, and then I'll do a video on that one. But yeah, the Pom Pom, and just like the Jelly Phone, it's, it's a really small device. That's, uh, I think this brand's Android. It's like a very custom version of Android. But yeah, it's just a very, very tiny phone. You might be wondering, well, why not uh, replace your iPhone SE with this phone? <laughs> this is too small, I think. The iPhone SE was just like the perfect small phone size. This is just too small, right? Not as small as the Neptune Pine, but still, it's not the type of phone that you would probably want to use. Um, I know this is the same screen size as the iPhone 4S, which I used a lot back in the day, but still, I think when we used the iPhone 4 and 4S, that was at a time when we didn't use the phone for everything right? <laughs> now we kind of use the phone for everything. So we need something that's a little bit bigger, like four inches, right? The SE is four inches. 3.5, a little bit too small. I know this was the original iPhone size, but still too small these days, right? Actually, I think this is smaller than 3.5. This is like 2.8. So this is really, really small. So yeah, I have this in my collection because it's it's uh, really unique though. And it's Palm. I know it's, it's not the same company as the original Palm, but still it's Palm branded. And uh, that's that's pretty unique because I bet many people don't even know that Palm was still making devices, right? All right, next up uh, from 2018. So these are all from 2018, uh, the last three devices. This one is the Aston Kern Aenorma uh, SR15, which is a DAP. This is a DAP, which is a dedicated audio player, a digital audio player, sorry. Digital audio player, and that's all it does. Um, it runs a modified version of Android and... All it does is play music. It does not do anything else. It doesn't play movies. It doesn't even play videos. Um, all it does is play music, and that's pretty much it. But it's a really good music player because it has a dedicated DAC. It has um, two headphone jacks, one for a 3.5, one for a 2.5 balanced. Um, and it has this dedicated volume control. So really, all this is is an updated iPod, but it's for people who really care about music, right? So for people who say that iPods are dead, well, they're not really dead, right? You still got dApps, right? Like this one, the Aston Kern, you still got like other ones, Fio, Onkyo makes a few, um, a lot of Chinese companies make them, right? Sony Walkmans have dedicated dApps, right? There's a few out there. 
Some of them can be pretty expensive. I think this one was actually more expensive than most phones, $700 when it was new. So the reason why it's so expensive is because one, not many people buy these compared to phones and uh, therefore they don't have the production scale. And then secondly, they put expensive uh, audio circuitry inside of them. So that's why. And also it's pretty well built. So it's made in Korea. So that's where my money's going. So yeah, that's a dedicated DAP. I use this for playing music, obviously for wired headphones. All right, next up, also from 2018, is Samsung Galaxy Watch Active 2. This is a um, smartwatch. It runs Tizen OS, which is pretty much Samsung's operating system at this time, even though it's uh, open source. But uh, yeah, this is a good, it's a good smartwatch. I actually prefer this to running uh, Wear OS because I think it's a little bit more fluid than Wear OS. Wear OS has a little bit of baggage in it. Um, and this is much more optimized. So I think if I, if I were to use an Android, uh, if I were to use a smartwatch for my Android phone, it would probably be the Samsung Galaxy Watch because um, the Tizen OS just feels very, very optimized and very fluid. So I like the experience of using this watch. So anyways, I have this because it runs Tizen and uh, it's a different smartwatch operating system. All right, um, next up, actually, let's go with, okay, I have this phone here. Uh, this is actually the Razer Phone 2. So this is the Razer Phone 2 with the Jungle Cat controllers attached to it. So you can see the Razer logo on the back. Uh, yeah, this came out in 2018 originally. The Jungle Cat controllers came out the next year. But uh, I mostly use this as an emulator device. So yeah, I don't use my Video Shield Portable or my Xperia Play for playing emulator games anymore. I use this one because the controls are really good. Uh, they're pretty solid. I wouldn't say they're quite as solid as the Nvidia Shield Portables, but they're still pretty solid because it's Razer after all. Razer makes some pretty decent quality stuff. And um, yeah, I use this as my main device for playing emulator games and stuff like that. So that's why I have this phone. I don't, I don't use it especially to play like modern mobile games, but mostly for retro games. All right, and then next up we have the Fio M5, which is also a music player. This is not a phone. Um, it's doesn't make calls or anything. It, the only the operating system, the only thing you can do is play music. So it's a DAP, a uh, digital audio player. But yeah, I have it because it's like, it's cool. It's like, um, I have it on a watch strap. So it's basically like the evolution of the iPod Nano 6th generation, right? Remember that one? That one came with like, that one you could buy a watch strap for. And then it was kind of like a music player on your wrist. So that's what this one is. It's a music player on your wrist, uh, which is... Sometimes better than a smartwatch because it has a micro SD card slot in it and you don't need to tether a phone to it. So yeah, that's uh, that's cool. If I want to listen to music, don't want to tether it to my phone, I have that. All right, next up. Also, I think this was late last year. So now we're getting to 2019 last year. This is the LG G8X, which is a dual display smartphone. Um, this is a, just a really good all around phone and it's really cheap too. It's uh, You can find it online for with the dual screen display for less than $500 or you can find it just standalone without the dual dis without the dual screen display for like half that price it's like 250 or something like that pretty good price for um, a phone with like basically flagship specs of uh, as of last year uh, so that will that'll still work this year right so this had last year's specs um, but flagship specs um, the dual display again if you're multitasking can be pretty useful and has really good audio circuitry, right? Has a dedicated uh, headphone jack, which you don't see many phones have nowadays, and a quad DAC. Um, so it's really good for playing music and has stereo speakers as well. And you know, you get the standard beautiful LG OLED display. So uh, cameras are, is pretty decent. I wouldn't say it's as good as the iPhones or the Samsung Galaxies, but um, you know, they're not bad. I mean, it's LG camera. LG cameras are usually uh, on the upper end. They're not the best, but they're not really bad either so I think most people would be okay with them uh, but yeah uh, I'll probably be replacing this phone with the surface duo once I get that one because that one's also a dual screen de device but it's meant for a dual screen right this one is like the dual screen is just an attachment it's not really meant for it it's like something you can add as kind of an accessory um, but the Microsoft surface duo that that phone was designed from the ground up for two displays so that's going to be a lot cooler also it's a lot more expensive than this one Probably I'll do a video on that one later, um, but that one hasn't come out yet, so that's not in this video. All right, so that's GX, um, dual screen, this dual screen smartphone. That's why I have that. And then um, next up, 
This is the iPhone 11 Pro, uh, which I've had since last year. You can call this pretty much my main phone, uh, my main camera phone, and it's mostly used for taking pictures and video, which is really good at because the iPhone 11 Pro has probably one of the best cameras on the market right now until the iPhone 12 comes out. Um, but yeah, this is a it's a good phone. I like. I used it during a lot of my trips last year. I went to the Bahamas, uh, New York City, with my parent, with my parents, my family, and I mostly used this device. I actually took pictures and video underwater when I was swimming in the Bahamas, and this this phone was able to do that. Like it's IP68 water resistant. I didn't think I could actually dive with it, but I just did some snorkeling, and I was able to take some pretty good pictures and video. And the iPhone was perfectly fine. So. Pretty good. Uh, I really like the ultra wide angle. Now that I've used the ultra wide angle, I can't really go back to your phone without ultra wide angle. <laughs> it's just really, really useful. So yeah, I mostly use this as my main camera phone. So yeah, the iPhone 11 Pro, probably one of the main phones I use right now. And then this is the Motorola Moto 360 third generation, which I got this year. Uh, I paired this with my Motorola Razr, and yeah, this is. I mean, it's a. It's the evolution of the Moto 360, right, which was one of the original round Android Wear phones. And this runs Wear OS, the latest one. I think it's still not as snappy as the uh, Galaxy Active 2, which runs Tizen. Um, so I don't use this one as much as the Galaxy Watch Active 2, but still, I have it because I think most people didn't even know that Moto 360 is still back, right? <laughs> I don't think that they know that this, this watch really exists. Um, it's licensed by Motorola, it's not really produced by them. Um, so it's actually made by, I think it's, it's, it's used by another company called eBuy now or something like that, but still Moto branded. Uh, so you still have standard Android wear features and stuff on it. So it's, it's a pretty decent smartwatch. I want to say it's the best one. Um, but it's a decent smartwatch and it's, I keep it here because I have to pair it with the, it's only natural that I pair a Motorola 360 with the Motorola Razr, right? <laughs> So this phone, uh, it's a folding phone. So yeah, uh, came out this year. I don't think it's popular. I think the Samsung Galaxy Z Flip kind of usurped it. But what can I say? It's a really cool looking device. Um, it's got the, the same kind of design as the original Razer. Sorry, not this Razer 2, the original Razer, the V3. Um, it's kind of got inspiration from that design, but it's a folding device. So you can do all your Android stuff with it, right? Actually, I like this device the reason I chose this, this device over the Galaxy Z Flip was one, because I knew that this device wasn't going to be as popular, and two, um, this display here is a lot bigger than the one on the Z Flip. So I actually use this main display for a lot of things, mostly for playing music though. This has really become kind of my main music player. Um, I mean the Astro and Current I use for my wired headphones, but if I want to use my Bluetooth headphones um, just casually, then the this this phone is the one I use because the main screen here is big enough that you can shuffle, you can like play music, start and stop, go through Spotify, um, or you can just, you know, it has 20, 120 gigs, so you know, I put some of my own music onto it. Shame it doesn't have expandable storage, but still, uh, or a headphone jack, but yeah, um, if I just want to use Bluetooth headphones, I can listen to music, and Doubles is a pretty good music player, and yeah, it's a folding phone. Um, so this, the folding screen, everything is really cool. Uh, it's not glass, I think this is plastic, so the Samsung uses glass, this is just plastic, which isn't as cool, but it's still, it's still cool just because it's folding, right, and it's a new technology, so, anyways, that's the Razer Fold, so the Motorola Razer Fold, I use this with the Moto360, of course, because it's Motorola, so, gotta pair Motorola with Motorola, right, anyways, really cool device, so I have that right now, it's my main kind of uh, music media player device right now. Last but not least, I have the Google Pixel 4a, which has kind of replaced my Google Pixel 2. So I used my Google Pixel 2 for a long time, I think for three years, and then uh, the battery started dying, it, did, it wouldn't charge very well anymore, so I had to replace it, and guess what? Google announced that they were coming out with the 4a, which is a really, um, really good budget phone. It's $350, better than the Pixel 2 in pretty much every way, except for one. There's one thing that I really wish that they put put on the 4A, which is water resistance, right? It's not IP67, 68 water resistant like the Pixel 2 was. So that's kind of a, a downgrade. But any other way, it's actually better than the Pixel 2, obviously. It's got the bezel-less design, uh, headphone jack comes back, better camera, obviously, um, upgraded internals, obviously. So in any other way, every other way, it's better than the Pixel 2 I had, except for the water resistance. But yeah, this has pretty much replaced the uh, Pixel 2 I had. 
as pretty much my main device for Project Fi, which is important for me because I travel a lot. So I use Google Project Fi a lot um, when I'm traveling, right? So my main US phone number, everything like that, um, that's what I'm using this for. So, and that's why you don't see my Pixel 2 anymore because uh, I just replaced that one with this. So, so yeah, um, that's pretty much all my phones. Uh, and this one just came out very, very recently, <clears throat> just last month. So yeah, 2020. All right, guys, and that's it. That's my entire, not my entire collection, but that's uh, the majority of it I wanted to show today. So one question after watching this video that some people might have is that not all my devices are represented here. So there are some devices that are missing. So some people who consistently watch my YouTube channel might be asking questions like, where's my Yoda Phone 3? I did a video on the Yoda Phone 3, right? Well, that device I kind of sold already, so that's not represented here. That would actually be in the top row since that device was released in 2017. But uh, sadly, I already sold that one. And where is my Cosmo Communicator? My Cosmo Communicator, I consider to be kind of on the verge of a UMPC device since it runs a full-blown Linux operating system. So that one, um, I might save for my UMPC video. So that's why the Cosmo Communicator is not represented here. Uh, my iPads are not here. Um, those I will actually put in the UMPC video. Those are actually quite big, so they're not represented here. And the upcoming Surface Duo, uh, which I'm going to be getting my hands on soon, that will also be in the UMPC video um, because I consider that kind of a hybrid device as well. So yeah, not all of my mobile devices are actually in this video, but this is the vast majority of them. Um, I'm going to be doing another video on my UMPCs and laptops and some of the other tablets and other devices I didn't show, like I mentioned, the Cosmo Communicator, I'm going to show in another video, um, the Surface Duo, which should be coming up soon, uh, I'm going to show in the uh, other videos. So yeah, uh, stay tuned guys, I'm just going to do a nice pan so you guys can see all the models again. All right, so second row, first row. This is all the devices I own from 2001 all the way to this year. All right, third row and fourth row. Yep, you can see this is the collection I've amassed over the years. And I wanted to do this video before I uh, started downsizing my collection. So, yeah guys, uh, that is it. That is my collection. Alright, so yeah, if you guys have any questions uh, about any of the devices here, then please leave them in the comment section below. And this is most of my devices, my mobile devices from 2001 to 2020, excluding all of my big ones. So I don't have my iPads or my big tablets. Um, I don't have my laptops or UMPC devices here, but that will be in another video that will be upcoming. So that's it guys. This is the majority of my mobile devices, um, at least the smaller ones. So stay tuned for the next video. I will make another one on the bigger devices. But for now, uh, these are my smaller devices and I hope you guys enjoyed my little breakdown for each one. Just a brief breakdown of why I have each one and, and why I think that they're special. So anyways guys, uh, that's it. Thanks for watching. Please leave me feedback below.